talked about that rookie season with you, Calvin, who works with us now at CSN, Rudy T, um, Moses. What, what do you remember about being a rookie in the NBA? My first meeting with my coach was Tom Masaki. He said, you scored a lot of points in college. We drafted you to be a point guard. And he said, shoot 10 shots with Calvin Murphy. I shot 10 shots. Murphy made like nine. I made like five. <laughs> he said, shoot 10 with Rudy T. I shot 10. Rudy shot eight bank shots and made the last two. I made like four. He said, shoot with Mike Nula. Shoot free throws. Mike shoots 10 free throws that don't even hit the rim. <laughs> I hit like seven. He says, are you getting your role on this team? Wow. That was the first time you met him? Yeah. He said, you're going to be a distributor. So when I came there, I lost 50 games that year. In addition, uh, Mo and I, we won 50 games and went to the finals. So we went from being the worst team to the best team right away. And then after that second season, you go to Golden State, Rick Barry comes here. Rick Barry is going to bring us an air of respectability. Rick is noted as a winner. Well, you know, John, you know, he's you know, he one of my best friends, and uh, I hate to see him go. He had a heck of a role. You know, here we had all these guys who like to shoot the ball, and he had to be the guy to keep everybody happy. So when the season begins, this locker will have someone else's name on it. The commissioner at that time decided what was fair compensation. And he decided that I had to go to, go to the Warriors out in San Francisco. And at that point, had you already started using drugs in Houston? Yes, that summer. Do you remember the first time you snorted cocaine? The very first time, which I need to go back to, was college at a party, mm -hmm. cocaine. Do you remember having any kind of thinking in your head, I shouldn't do this, this is going to be bad? No, because I never did any drugs. I drank, and I didn't realize drinking was a drug, but I drank. And I would tease the guys who used to smoke. Man, you guys are crazy. You guys are nuts. And when I tried cocaine, it had no smell. No, only you knew. And so I said, okay, that's a little different. Never use it again until I got to the pros. Do you remember what it did to you, the feeling of being high? It, made me become, it made all my fears go away. I was not hesitant to talk. I became quite talkative. I went from being real shy to real loud. And um, all my fears went away for that 45 minutes. Here you are, this all-American basketball and tennis player, great student, and you have all these fears. What were you afraid of? Failing. Fear of failing, fear of rejection. Uh, I think what people confuse athletes with is that they are not people. They look at the basketball, they look at the money, but they don't look at the life. And um, my life was uh, well balanced. Uh, I would not be your prime candidate for an addiction. What did you think cocaine was doing to your body? Nothing. I believe the myth that it didn't have any physical harmful effects on you. And I don't know when I crossed the line um, where I began to miss practices, begin to be uh, not showing up and not being where I was going. I just remember it making me very paranoid. And then it, when it slipped, and I, and I thought it was everything else but that. I was tired of basketball. It made me violate all of my value systems. My mind tells me I need it. But the emotional and spiritual bankruptcy is the big component. I'm empty inside. I have no mental or emotional defense when my mind tells me I need to go get high at that time. How did denial work for you? The biggest part of it was I was able to fool myself. It hadn't been all bad. There's been a lot of good times in my life. And so that was just the time I went to. I'm sure you've had some times you've gone through that you don't want to talk about, like yeah. bad checks or something. So <laughs> just don't discuss those things. I just try to go on and do the best and be the most positive person I can be. When you do something so good that you believe your own bull****, <laughs> that you're a pretty good character. When you believe that you know you're lying and you believe your own lie. At that point, what kind of a husband were you? 
kind of father were you? Uh, always loved my daughter. We only had Tavia at the time. Always there with Tavia. Never abusive to Debbie. Abusive to myself by doing drugs. And um, I don't know why Debbie stayed with me. I don't know that I would have stayed with me. Debbie did stick with you. And then in the early 80s, you get traded from Golden State to the Bullets to the Spurs and Rockets are waived or reinstated about 10 times. No, 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 not 10 times. No, I counted. I got the, I got the, you want me to go through the list? Yeah. January 25th, waived by the Bullets. August 29th, 83, signed by the Cavaliers. A month later, waived by the Cavaliers. Wait, Two months later, signed by the Spurs. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You were the number one pick not that long ago, and all of a sudden you're, you become sort of this vagabond journeyman. What, what happened to your identity? That, you, know, you know, that's a good question. I, I never thought of myself as, not as who I am today. I just hadn't grown up. Coach Fritz saved my life. He gets mad at me when I tell this story. But he really saved my life. I have an article. I think he has articles that where I say he saved my life. And he said there's a lot of people mad at him for that. <laughs>